During his 40-year career with the United Nations, Missouri native David Gressley has witnessed more than his share of global challenges, from famines to global health threats like Ebola, to civil wars, to the birth of a new nation. I spoke to him recently on the eve of his retirement as the UN's top person in Yemen. He shared his most gratifying moment as a humanitarian. We talked about ego, about hope, and a recent UN triumph, removing more than one million gallons of oil from a rusting tanker called the Safar off the coast of Yemen. You and your team played a critical role in preventing an enormous potential oil spill that would have had massive environmental and ecological and uh, economic consequences for the entire region um, by offloading um, oil from a ground tanker to Safar. Can you tell us a little bit about why did the UN matter in this particular instance? Why did the UN's role, why was the UN's role so terribly important here? Well, I think the Secretary General summed it up uh, simply, which is the UN was the only body that could actually have done that. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the reason he said that is because the parties were in conflict, um, uh, supported by the government of Yemen, supported by a coalition of regional uh, countries. Uh, only the UN had access to all sides. And therefore, not only was the UN in a position to do it, it almost had an obligation mm -hmm. because of that to do it. Um, so in that sense, it was extremely important that the UN step forward, take up that responsibility. Um, there were eight years of discussion <laughs> about how to solve the problem. We're actually moving the last bits of equipment off the FSO software. Some people talked about military solutions, which of course would never have worked. Others talked of other t types of technical solutions, but in the end it was a political problem that had to be solved politically before even launching into the, uh, the technical solution. Mm -hmm. And only the UN was on the ground, only the UN was on the ground at that point in time to do it. During your more than four decades of experience with the United Nations uh, on development and humanitarian issues, uh, you've tackled many challenges. Uh, in the Middle East, in the Sahel, uh, Horn of Africa. Can you think about, from the beginning of your career, the end of your career, somewhere in between, just a, a, a moment that embodies the sweep of your professional career at the United Nations? Uh, that's a very difficult question, but uh, I, I think if I had to choose a moment, I would uh, go back to the uh, referendum in South Sudan, uh, which was a referendum for uh, independence from Sudan itself. Um, what I loved about that moment of the referendum uh, was how peaceful that, that was after 20 years of war. I was very, very proud of what the United Nations did to help create that moment, uh, whether it was from a humanitarian point of view, uh, really getting kids into school for the first time, opening uh, thousands of kilometers of roads, demining, uh, all the things required to make it ready but also support to elections, to census, and ultimately the referendum itself. So everything the UN can do was done to help that path to, to independence in, uh, in 2011. And the referendum itself was a, was a beautiful day, <laughs> seeing people lined up for the first time in their lives mm -hmm. to vote on the future of their country, not just an elected official, but what they wanted for the future. And everywhere I traveled that day, People lined up peacefully. They were very happy. It was a joyous day. Mm -hmm. And it was almost unanimous uh, that they find their own path forward in an independent country. Beautiful day, beautiful moment. As you look at the next 10 years, what do you think are the emerging trends that we should be focused on? Um, development, humanitarian work is different than it was even 10, 15, 20 years ago. What, what do you see is uh, emerging that might uh, challenge our thinking or make us do our job differently? Well, I think the UN, like any organization, has to continuously reinvent itself yeah. um, to face the challenges as they also evolve over time. Humanitarian action, to use your example, today is not what it was 25 mm -hmm. years ago. In many cases, it's much more complex because the operating environment uh, is much more complex. We, we see the evolution even of warfare on the ground. Uh, which complicates humanitarian assistance. I work in a country with drones uh, that has drones, ballistic missiles uh, that, um, as we see right now, threatening even the, sh the shipping lanes in the, in the Red Sea. 
So it makes for a very difficult environment in which to work, and we need to adapt to that. And I think we'll see continued evolution uh, in that regard, um, not only for the humanitarian side, but on the, on the peace and security side. And I do hope that we find ways to continue to develop the tools required on the peace and security side to, to solve uh, problems locally. Uh, and, and one of the key ways, I believe, of doing that is to focus uh, internally on those tensions that exist where countries are in conflict mm -hmm. and, and to find uh, uh, solutions politically that uh, help deal with uh, very old grievances in many cases uh, and a more peaceful path forward in time. And that will be the core challenge as we go forward. Without that, um, humanitarian uh, needs will just increase. The need for recovery will increase. Development will be compromised. So we got to focus on the basics, peace and security. How do you remain hopeful um, uh, you know, when you're dealing with political and economic crises that are uh, you know, so difficult to resolve? How do you remain hopeful despite all that? Well, you, first of all, I think you have to take your own ego out of what <laughs> you're doing, and, and I'll explain why I say mm -hmm. that. Because usually these problems, are, they're quite complex by, by their very nature, and they take time. Mm -hmm. And often we, we project our own time frame into the situations in which we work. And you need to step back and say, I will make a contribution uh, while I'm here. Mm -hmm. Others will follow, and we'll have to take the time it needs to find the right, the right kind of uh, political solution that, that is sustainable. Effectively, and I say this often, I'm a short-term pessimist. It's going to get worse, <laughs> <laughs> but a long-term optimist, because I think in the end, uh, uh, peoples in various countries will find the way forward. We need to understand that that may take time, and therefore we need to accompany them for that whole time until they are successful in creating a stable political environment, a good governance system, rule of law, and effective support to the people of their country. It will come. It will come everywhere. And each of us need to make our own contribution as we go forward through time. Well, it's a good approach to life more generally. <laughs> um, and uh, we're just deeply appreciative of your service to the United Nations for over four decades and for all the significant contributions you made. Thank you for being with us today and thank you for talking to us.